Introduction St. Leonard of Port Maurice, 1676-1751 The booklet, his great sermon on the little number of those that are saved. St. Leonard of Port Maurice was a most holy Franciscan friar who lived at the monastery of St. Bonaventura in Rome. A preacher, an ascetic writer, he was also one of the greatest missioners in the history of the Church. St. Leonard was born in 1676 at Porto Mauricio on the Italian Riviera and died at the monastery of St. Bonaventura, Rome, in 1751. After a brilliant course of study with the Jesuits in Rome, he joined the so-called Reformella, an offshoot of the Reformata branch of the Franciscan order, and in 1970. In, sorry, in 1697, he received the habit. And after making his novitiate at Ponticelli in the Sabine Mountains, he completed his studies at the principal house of the Reformella San Bonaventura. After his ordination, he remained there as lector professor and expected to be sent on the Chinese missions but he was soon afterwards seized with severe gastric hemorrhage and became so ill that he was sent to his native climate of Porto Mauricio where there was a monastery of the Franciscan observance 1704 after four years he was restored to health and began to preach in Porto Mauricio and the vicinity. When Cosimo III de Medici handed over the monastery degli Monti near Florence to the members of the Rifamella, St. Leonard was sent hither under the auspicious and by desire of Cosimo the Third, and began shortly to give missions to the peoples in Tuscany. These were marked by many extraordinary conversions and great results. His colleagues and he always practice the greatest austerities and most severe penances during these missions. In 1710, he founded the monastery of Icontro on a peak in the mountains, about four and a quarter miles from Florence. Icontro, I-C-O-N-T-R-O, to which he and his assistants could retire from time to time after missions and devote themselves to spiritual renewal and fresh austerities. In 1720, he crossed the borders of Tuscany and held his celebrated missions in central and southern Italy. In kindling with zeal the entire population Popes Clement the second the twelfth and Benedict the fourteenth called him to Rome. The latter especially held him in high esteem, both as a preacher and as a propagandist, and exacted a promise that he would come to Rome to die. And indeed he did. Everywhere St. Leonard made abundant conversions 
and was very often obliged both in cities and country districts to preach in the open. As the churches could not contain the thousands who came to listen, so brilliant and holy was his eloquence that once when he gave a two weeks mission in Rome, the Pope and College of Cardinals came to hear him. He founded many pious societies and confraternities and exerted himself especially to the spread of the devotion of the Stations of the Cross, the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the perpetual adoration of the Most Blessed Sacrament, and devotion to the Immaculate Conception. One of his most ardent desires was to see the Immaculate Conception defined as a dogma of faith by the Holy See. He also gave us the divine praises, which are said at the end of benediction. Besides the celebrated Stations of the Cross in the Colosseum at Rome, St. Leonard erected 571 others in all parts of Italy while on his different missions. From May to November 1744 St. Leonard preached in the island of Corsica which is that time belonged to the Republica of Genoa and which was frightfully torn by party strife. In November 1751, when he was preaching to the Bolognese, Benedict the Fourteen called him to Rome, as already there were indications of his rapidly approaching end. The strain of his missionary labours and his mortifications had completely exhausted his body. He arrived on the evening of the 26th of November, 1751, at his beloved monastery of St. Bonaventura, on the Palatine, and expired on the same night at 11 o'clock at the age of 75 years after twenty-four hours of in uninterrupted preaching. In the church of this monastery, that partly the partly incorrupt body of the saint is kept in the high altars. Pius VI pronounced his beatification on the 19th of June, 1796, and Pius XI his canonization on the 29th of June, 1796. Eighteen, eighteen sixty-seven. Sorry. His canonization. The Franciscan Order celebrates his feast on the 26th of November. But outside this order, it is often celebrated on the 27th of November. One of St. Leonard of, Prince of Port Maurice's most famous sermons was on the little number of those who are saved. It was the one he relied on for the conversion of great sinners. This sermon, like his other writings, was submitted by canonical examination during the process of canonization. In it he reviews the various states of life of Christians and concludes with the little number of those who are saved. In relation to the totality of men, the reader who meditates on this remarkable text, or the listener, 
will grasp the soundness of its argument, which has earned it the approbation of the Church. Here is the great missionary's vibrant and moving sermon. On the little number of those that are saved. Thanks be to God, the number of the Redeemer's disciples is not so small, St. Leonard writes and, and has confessed, that the wickedness of the scribes and Pharisees is able to triumph over them. Although they strove to culminate innocence and to deceive the crowd with their treacherous words and by discrediting the doctrines and character of our Lord, finding spots even in the sun, many still recognized him as the true Messiah. And unafraid of either chastisements or threats, openly joined his cause. Did all those who followed Christ follow him even unto glory? Oh, this is where I revere the profound mystery and silently adore the abysses of the divine decrees, rather than rashly deciding on such a great point. The subject I will be treating today is a very grave one. It has caused even the pillars of the church to tremble, filled the greatest saints with terror, and populated the deserts with anchorites. The point of this instruction is to decide whether the number of Christians who are saved is greater or less than the number of Christians who are damned. It will, I hope, produce in you a salutary fear of the judgments of God. Brothers, Sisters, because of the love I have for you, I wish I were able to reassure you with the prospect of eternal happiness by saying to each of you, You are certain to go to paradise. The greater number of Christians is saved. So you also will be saved. But how can I give you this sweet assurance if you revolt against God's decrees, as though you were your own worst enemies. I observe in God a sincere desire to save you, but I find in you a decided inclination to be damned. So, what will I be doing today if I speak clearly? I will be displeasing to you, but if I do not speak, I will be displeasing to God. Therefore, I will divide this subject into two points. In the first one, to fill you with dread, I will let the theologians and fathers of the church decide on the matter and declare that the greater number of Christian adults are damned. And in silent adoration of that terrible mystery, I will keep my own sentiments to myself. In the second point, I will attempt to defend the goodness of God versus the godless, by proving to you that those who are damned are damned by their own malice because they wanted to be damned. So then, here are two very important truths. If the first truth frighten you, do not hold it against me, as though I wanted to make the road of heaven narrower for you. For I want to be neutral in this matter. Rather hold it against the theologians and fathers of the church who will engrave this truth in your heart by the force of reason. If you 
are disillusioned by the second truth. Give a thanks to God over it, for He wants only one thing, that you give your hearts totally to Him. Finally, if you oblige me to tell you clearly that I think, and what I think, I will do so for your consolation. The Teaching of the Fathers of the Church It is not vain curiosity, but salutary precaution to proclaim from the height of the pulpit certain truths which serve wonderfully to contain the indolence of libertines who are always talking about the mercy of God and about how easy it is to convert who live plunged in all sorts of sins and are soundly sleeping on the road to hell. To disillusion them and waken them from their torpor, today let us examine this great question. Is the number of Christians who are saved greater than the number of Christians who are damned? Pious souls, you may leave. This sermon is not for you. Its sole purpose is to contain the pride of libertines who cast their holy fear of God out of their heart and join forces with the devil who, according to the sentiment of Eusebius, damns souls by reassuring them. To resolve the great doubt, let us put the fathers, the great fathers of the church, both Greek and Latin, on one side, on the other the most learned theologians and historians, and let us put the Bible in the middle for all to see. Now, listen not to what I will say to you, for I have already told you that I do not want to speak for myself or decide on the matter, but listen to what these great minds have to tell you, they who are beacons in the Church of God, early fathers of the Church of God to give light to others so that they will not miss the road to heaven. In this manner, guided by the triple light of faith, authority and reason, we will be able to resolve this grave matter with certainty. Note well that there is no question here of the human race taken as a whole, nor of all Catholics taken without distinction, but only of Catholic adults who have free choice and are the capable of cooperating in the great matter of their salvation. First, let us consult the theologians recognized as examining things most carefully and as not exaggerating in their teaching. Let us listen to two learned cardinals, Kajtan and Balamine, that is Kajtan, C-A-J-E-T-A-N, and Balamine, B E L L A R M I N E. They teach that the greater number of Christian adults are damned. And if I had time to point out the reasons upon which the, they base themselves, you would be convinced of it yourselves. But I will limit myself here to quoting Suarez. 
S U A R E Z. After consulting all the theologians and making a diligent study of the matter, Suarez wrote The most common sentiment which is held is that among Christians there are more damned souls than predestined souls. Add the authority of the Greek and Latin fathers to that of the theologians and you will find that almost all of them say that the same thing. This is the sentiment of Saint Theodore, Saint Basil, Saint Ephraim and Saint John Chrysostom. What is more, according to, to Baronius, is was a common opinion among the Greek fathers that mm -hmm. this truth was expressly revealed to Saint Simeon Stylites, that is S I M E O N S T Y L I T E S, Saint Simeon Stylites or Stylites. And that after this revelation for him, it was to secure his salvation that he decided to live standing on top of a pillar for 40 years. Exposed to the weather, a model of penance and holiness for everyone. Simeon Stylites, S-T-Y-L-I-T-E-S. Now let us consult the Latin fathers. You will hear Saint Gregory saying clearly, Many attain to faith, but few to the heavenly kingdom. Saint Aslan declares, There are few who are saved. St. Augustine the Great states even more clearly, Therefore few are saved in comparison to those who are damned. The most terrifying, however, is St. Jerome. At the end of his life, in the presence of his disciples, he spoke these dreadful words. Out of 100,000 people whose lives have always been bad, you will find barely one who is worthy of indulgence. Out of 100,000 people whose lives have always been bad, you will find barely one who is worthy of indulgence. That was as he was dying, so he must have seen something to have said such harsh words of St. Jerome speaks. The words now of Holy Scripture. But thy but why seek out the opinions of the fathers and theologians when Holy Scripture settles the question so clearly? Look in to the Old and New Testaments and you will find a multitude of figures, symbols and words that clearly point out this truth. Very few are saved. In the time of Noah, the entire human race was submerged by the deluge and only eight people were saved into that ark. 
Saint Peter says, This ark was the figure of the church. While Saint Augustine adds, And those eight people who were saved into the ark signify that very few Christians are saved, because there are very few who sincerely renounce the world, and those who renounce it only in words do not belong to the mystery represented by that ark. The Bible also tells us that only two Hebrews out of two million entered the promised land after going out of Egypt and that only four escaped the fire of Sodom and the other burning cities that perished with it. All of this means that the number of the damned who will be cast into the fire like straw is far greater than that of the saved, whom the Heavenly Father will one day gather into his barns like precious wheat. I would not finish if I had to point out all the figures of which Holy Scripture confirms this truth. Let us content ourselves with listening to the living oracle of the incarnate wisdom. What did our Lord answer the curious man in the gospel who asked him, Lord, is it only a few to be saved? Did he keep silence? Did he answer hatingly? Did he Conceal his thought for fear of frightening the crowd? No. Questioned by only one. He addresses all of those present. He says to them, You ask me if there are only few who are saved? Here is my answer. Strive to enter by the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Who is spreading and who is speaking here? It is the Son of God, eternal truth, who on another occasion says even more clearly, Many are called, but few are chosen. He does not say that all are called and that out of them all men few are chosen, but that many are called. Which means, as St. Gregory explains, that out of all men many are called to the true faith, but out of them few are saved. Brothers and sisters, these are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who are they clear? Are they clear? They are true. Tell me now if it is possible for you to have faith in your heart and not tremble. I will stop here and you will find the rest of this pamphlet in the above. I will call it, because the next verse says, Salvation in the Various States of Life. And this is the beginning of the book of the sermon that St. Leonard of Port Maurice spoke in the 16th century and it was called on the little number of those that are saved. Tune in for the next.